Jet. to the Lord of Welcome to Simply and Jack. We're here with Frank McKenney in this lovely tree house in North Delaware Beach, Florida. We have to have conversations ongoing as always. Hello Frank. Welcome back to the tree house. <laughs> yes, this is my third time. On this rainy day, but we have a beautiful ocean out there and there's so much creativity running through yeah. the air in here. Don't you feel it? Yeah, so, so and it's so peaceful time. here. So peaceful. I just want to have my cup of ginger tea in the back and just relax. <laughs> well, we have a king size bed up there if you want to go oh, take a little rest. God. We, oh my God. Oh my, this is amazing. Oops, so sorry. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask you, long t not too long ago, we caught a glimpse of you um, hollering a tire across the local bridge. Can you tell us what that's about? You gave me some water that day, if I remember Yeah, correctly. yeah, we wanted to see. I was training at the time for an ultra marathon where I was running a 51 mile race in uh, Cape Fear, North Carolina. And the uh, dragging of the tire, which was a harness around my waist yeah, with a tire going behind me, Florida is a very flat place, there's no hills, so dragging the tires simulates the hills that I would encounter during the race. Oh, but thank God you came by with the water, because I think it was about <laughs> 100 degrees and I was dying. That was very helpful. I was like, this guy is so dedicated to what he's doing, you know, we got to plot in that. She was persistent, she said, we gotta go see Frank, we gotta go see Frank. That was, <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, we're going to talk about... Um, the three B's, something you're involved with. You're doing so many things. I mean, you know, at first in the segment I didn't mention, but I'm sure that everybody knows you're an author, you know, and everything else that you're doing, being a father, a husband, a humanitarian, and uh, God, real estate, you know, it, 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 you're doing so much. You know, now I know you're involved with um, the three B's, the Boca Ballroom. Battle. Battle. That is over. That is like a, a, the local version of Dancing with the Stars. Okay. So I, yeah, I had to, I was a decathlete in high school. A decathlete is a person who can play any sport. Like you yeah. put a racket like in my so. hand or a basketball, or you, I can play. So I thought I could dance. But I saw you, you got Well, off. but that's, but that's <laughs> three, <laughs> that's three months of, re of rehearsals twice uh, a week. I mean, they turned me from uh, two left feet into somebody who could perform. And goodness. it was all to raise money for, to send kids to college who can't oh, afford wow. to go. That was oh, the whole idea. So we raised thirty-five thousand dollars, and that'll send a couple of kids to college who would end up not well, being perhaps able to go. Have a chance they wouldn't to have go. a chance to go. Wow! wow. And um, uh, another thing that you know we want to touch today is um, you don't only build houses; you build villages. And um, one of the things is in my lovely country of um, in Haiti, and I know that um, I had a chance to go on the internet to saw the work you've done with the village, the school. There's a school there clean water and um, everything else. Tell us a little bit about So that. we love your country. We yes, absolutely love Haiti. So we go, I've been going to, I'm a white Haitian, right? I mean, I've been Oh, going, <laughs> oh yeah, you're ahead know, of me. <laughs> I, I, I really love the people. I love the topography. I just love the aura there. I've been going there for 12 years. We've built, well, we are starting our 23rd village in the last 13 years. And when I say village, it's a it's a whole self-sufficient village that combines housing, yes. 40 to 50 houses, with a community center. Inside wow. the community center is a clinic. Wow. There's renewable food. There's clean drinking water. There's some kind of free enterprise or capitalism so yes, that the village can be self-sufficient. Yeah. And then uh, then there's the schooling that also takes place in the community center. And so you know w one of the things that draws me to your country is is the people. It's the fact that I don't I like the fact that government doesn't bother us when we're there. Like here, if we try to do something, the government's all up in your hair. Which yeah. <laughs> but, but over yeah, there, gorgeous, by the, way. the government loves us and the government stays out of the way and, and we get, I can build a whole village in six months wow, right. for 400 people. And, and it doesn't, you know, in business you have a return on investment. We know what yes, that means, an yeah. ROI. Mm -hmm. You learned that in school, or if you didn't learn it, you need to look up what an ROI is yes. if you're going to business. It, we've coined the phrase ROD, return on donation. Wow. How far can we stretch our donors' dollars? So, I mean, if somebody ends up buying a book from us, it's 25 bucks, I can provide 250 meals to the poor in from Haiti one from one book. Oh. I can build a whole house in Haiti, a concrete house for a family of 8 to 10, which is the average size of the yeah. families in Haiti. I can build a whole house for four grand. Yeah, so that's really stretching the donor's dollar extremely far. 
I, I love the United States, of course it's my country, but for me to think I could build a house for four grand for a homeless family here is impossible. Yeah, for some people to like, it's pretty much like a down payment on a vehicle. It's, you know? it's if that, exactly. Yeah. So we can build, I mean, put in perspective for people watching this here in the United States, we can build a whole village, 40 houses, community center, clinic, renewable food, clean drinking water, free enterprise, a whole village for about $300,000 or the cost of one house in Palm Beach County. You know, the average oh, house in Palm Beach oh, County is around 300 grand. Yes, 300 grand. Think yeah, about that. Yeah. You know, so a whole village, there's 400 people, 400 beautiful Haitian people are affected. That's why we're over in, in Haiti doing our work we're doing. What drawn you, I mean, to Haiti? I know you love it and from your work. I mean, when was that spark when you know that, you know, Haiti was calling and um, you just had to, to go there? Your family, you have a family, you have a child, you know, you have a lovely home. I mean, your comfort zone, you know, how did that happen? Well, it's not, it, it, the thing in life, you don't want to exist in your comfort zone. It, it becomes very boring and, and, and the stimulation factor goes down and people, you need to work outside your comfort zone. The comfort zone is really underneath your covers at, at night when you sleep. That's the only time I believe in being in a comfort zone. Sleep being fine, it's safe. <laughs> but then the day you should be outside of your comfort zone. And so Haiti, when I was a young man, a very young man at 18, 19 years old, I worked alongside Haitians on a golf course yeah. as a maintenance worker. And I earned the nickname, the White Haitian. Yeah. It wasn't because I knew anything about the Haitian culture, it's because I worked hard. The Haitian work ethic is really strong. Haitians work hard. So I was working alongside Haitians, I was the only white guy, and they called me the White Haitian. And then as I got a little bit older, I realized your country is now, and depending on what statistics you look at, is the poorest country in the world. Yes, yeah, pretty much so. Uh, I mean, right. not the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, poorest country in the world. There is no social service net, meaning social service program to catch the poor in your country. We have so many of those here. We have too many of them in the United States. Yes. So my early connection to, to the Haitian work ethic, the fact that Haiti is only you know two hours away over those shores, and I can get there quickly, and it's the poorest place in the world, makes it attractive to us. It's attractive to me. Your heart has to be in it. You know, it's not just about, you know, the, the press, one thing I know about you is like um, one of the things you're running in the sun in Haiti and the Haitian people do not understand what you're doing, which pretty much for your training. Right. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that. It's so, not too crazy. Yeah, some of the races I run are in very hot locations. Yeah. And Haiti, you know, we know how hot Haiti yeah, is. Yeah, very hot. So when I go there with our donors, I'll usually go for a pretty long run. I remember I did I ran from one side of Haiti to the other once, like 25 miles. Uh, the last time we were there, we did like 15 miles. We ran from outside Lester. Like way past St. Mark, all the way back to our hotel, it was maybe 15 miles. And and you run through the streets in Haiti. I was wearing white running <laughs> shorts with my long hair and, and, and maybe no shirt. And the kids, the number of kids that would come up and run with me, you know, like, who is this white guy? Where did he, he came out of a spaceship or something? Why is he in our country running? So it was like a Pied Piper, you know, we were running And not the only that, they know that there's really no reason for you to run, perhaps, you know, they know you were sufficient, you had a car, vehicle to drive. Yeah, they didn't understand. That, didn't understand, they didn't understand. That. But, but a lot of people said, weren't you scared? And I said, because people were coming home from work. In our country, when we come home from work, we carry a briefcase. Yeah. Well, when people in Haiti are coming home from work, they're carrying a machete, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I'm running, I'm running against traffic and there's people coming at me at machetes. But they, that was their, that's the briefcase. Yeah. That's what they used to yeah. cut the, the bananas so off the tree. Yeah. So I so wasn't afraid okay. at all. People that were protecting me, that were with me, said, oh my God, watch out, he's carrying a machete. I said, they're, they're not going to harm me. No, they're not going to harm me. No. Well, we're going to take a break, Frank, and we'll be right back. We'll take a break, we'll be right back to it with our conversation with Mr. Frank McKenna. Back to Simply I'm Jan. We're here having a lovely conversation with Frank and with you guys. Some of the stuff you guys did not see on camera. We were having our chat. We we're glad to hear. And now we're here to talk about Frank's books. And um, you know the books he's have written. I, I believe you've written more than four. Right? There's one more, yeah. There's one more. Five. Yeah. And um, just tell us a little bit about each of them. You know I mean, what they mean to you. I know my favorite. Right here. 
So this is about your daughter. Tell us. Yeah, about. this is this is the only fiction book I wrote. This is a novel, Dead Fred Flying Lunchbox in the Good Luck Circle. Every work in fiction is rooted in some form of reality. Remember yes, that. So <laughs> my reality was I walk my daughter to school every single day from pre-kindergarten to eighth grade. It's 1,650 times. She never sat in the back seat of a car. Never. I mean, never. Even on a day like today, we would walk. Wow. And we took those adventures. You know, walking through this. Nature preserve. This kind of my backyard looks like a tropical rainforest over this drawbridge, and I and I fictionalized it and codified it into a very deeply fantastical story that teaches kids how to gain self-esteem. Basically, it's in a lot of schools like this because kids aren't allowed to be kids long enough anymore. I think they have to grow up too soon. We we teach them how to be kids and overcome some of the challenges in their lives. Yeah, she's school. amazing. Yeah, she she's turned out great. Yeah, I mean, she's really great. You know, she's going to be. I know she's ready for college. She's going to college next year. Yeah. Yep. Emptiness, Frank. I know. Yeah. Maybe I'll write another book then. <laughs> okay. This this is my spiritual book. Yeah, we have a lot of people. I'm a Christian, a believer, and this Amen. is the book based upon uh, the gospel passage from Luke 12:48. This is to whom much is entrusted, much is expected, and this is really how to, it teaches you how to recognize life's great tap moments when God comes down, taps you on the shoulder, yeah. calls you to more, and how to act. This is like my a very calling. like a calling, like yeah. doing what we're doing in Haiti. Yeah. This is my very first book. You can tell by the different hairstyles oh as we God. go through. Oh my God! You look like Kenny, um, the the guy with the saxophone, Ken. Kenny, Kenny G. G. Wow, oh my God! A lot of different hairstyles over oh, the year. Wow. But this is really a great book for people who are starting out in life, in business, and this is. You know, I wrote this in my late thirties. Make it big. Forty nine secrets for building a life of extreme success. So forty nine real short chapters, and you know, seven or eight pages long, and you can really get that's a lot out of this book. Like. This this is the one that's probably the well, it is the best seller, and it's still selling today, some twelve years later. This is my real estate book, Burst This, Frank McKay's Bubble Proof Real Estate Strategy. So if you want to get into real estate, how do you bubble proof your real estate investments? How do you make money in the business? And I have one other real estate book called Frank McKay's Maverick Approach. And the last thing I want to tell you, I know you've heard of many people in the world. How can you tell you know tell us about you know one of many faces um, that has you know equally enrolled you, touched you, you know, still in your heart? I know you've met many, many people. Is there someone particular that has left? Like a strong... I think you should have role models. I think you should have mentors. There's no doubt about it because you can't... And mentors can come in the form of books if you can't get in front of people. I think my my primary mentor in life was Rich DeVos. He, he was the founder or co-founder of Amway. He's one of the richest people in the world. He's still alive. He's 88 years old. Uh, he owns the Orlando Magic. But he's the one who taught me how to put together my professional highest calling, like building houses, with my spiritual highest calling taking care of people in Haiti. He, he taught me that you could have both and how to, how to integrate both. That was simple. Would you aspire with him? Yeah, and, and how to really, because some people are all about making money, but yet you know, their lives are very unfulfilling. <laughs> if you find a spiritual highest calling, you can continue to make the money, but there's a purpose. And, and he, he really helped me with that. The other thing, you know, you have, <coughs> you have you people. you help us clarify a little bit because, you know, you can let them know since you make all this millions and I know you're not about money. To let them know that money is part of wealth, but it's not the actual wealth. I know you live by that. Well, the Bible, t the second thing the Bible talks about, be behind love is money. The money is referenced in the Bible more than anything think, but yeah. love. Okay, so it, it is it is biblical. It, what 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 it, what what money can do is it will provide all the relief and all the comfort you want. And think about that. Use your imagination. Yeah. If you're having struggles and if you had a bunch of money, you would have all the relief and comfort, but you would never have any happiness. You will not find happiness through money. I can tell you that. I've sold to rich people who are unhappy. I know what it's like. So, I mean, the, the, the money is nothing more than a tool to use to, like, how many cars can you put in your garage? How many clothes can you actually wear? How, you know, how much food can you eat? There's a limit. Once you have met those needs, that money is used to, is meant to be used as a tool, a responsible steward of the blessings God's given you in the form of financial blessing to help others who are less fortunate. They bless you, then you bless others. You have to. That's what it's meant to be. Human, human beings are not conditioned to do well with excess. We don't do well with excess. It blows lives up. And you can think excess if you take too many drugs, if you have too much money, if you have yes. too many lovers. If you have, yes. It blows up lives. So we have to know when we have excess, let's say it's excess money, it's meant to be used for the betterment of mankind, not just for your ego and filling your garage with more cars. Um, tell us about the the home you built, um, little, you know, the Apollon. Apollon. Yeah. yeah. Tell us a and that's a few years ago. It was the world's largest and most expensive certified green home. 
So environmentally just, responsible, you remember? Yeah, it would be interesting, loved it. Yeah, it was a great house, and so we tried to be environmentally responsible in the craft that we are involved in, which is building very large houses on the ocean. And it worked. And it worked. And uh, another thing that, um, how do you go, a lot of people, you know, perhaps it's not clear to them, you end up in Haiti, but the homes you build for others, um, the price range with the money here in the States, what is the, the price range? You know, it's, it's, it's evolved, MJ. It, it's gone from, my first house was a $50,000 fixer-upper you know, yeah. that we sold it you know, many years ago. And then we went all the way to a $50 million mansion back in like the mid-2000s when the market was going crazy. Now what we're seeing, and, and, and hopefully by the end of the year we can make a, fo like a formal announcement, but we're finding with the ultra wealthy, because that's who I sell to. You know, that's my, that's yes. my, you know, they've been around since the Roman era. Some call you Robin Hood, but I don't think you fit that criteria because he was stealing from others. Right, we sell to the rich. Yeah, we, we don't you, steal from the rich. Yeah, we you sell sold to, to the rich right. and you assist the That's the difference. So that's totally different. Yeah. Yeah. But there are people who think we steal from the rich because we charge so much money, but they pay. So we sell them the house. They have the funds to do it. They, what I'm finding is people at that level, they want still the beauty and the opulence and the grandeur but smaller scale so what you will see coming out of this design studio here are much smaller houses uh i mean much smaller than i was doing before but appealing to people who don't want to manage 10,000 square feet anymore i can't wait to show what we're working on how often do you go to your main corporate office and tell us a little there isn't about one anymore i closed anymore. it two two years ago because I don't need, if you have a place like this, Tell right, us a little bit about this tree house, because a lot of people, we're in a tree house, okay? Tell us about it, what, you know, what inspired you to build a tree house? Well, first of all, everybody who works for me, which isn't a lot, I have a few people, they all, I all live and work from and home. And that's enough. They work from home. If they where, can, where if they, was, where were you when I needed, I needed to work from home with all these children of mine? <laughs> if they can get their job done, why, well, I don't, they, they can work, amazing. From, they can oh work from God. Mars for all I care, but oh I'm God. demanding they have to get their work done. If they don't, then they're going to be fired, but I don't care where they work from. So we had a main office and I closed it because I never went there and, and I felt like, why do I need that? If they're, they could work from home, you know, now when we have a project, I work from the site, like I will work from the construction trailer. But the treehouse is a place that I've had since just after 9-11, and it draws out and is very conducive to creativity, yeah. ingenuity. I hadn't written a book until I built the treehouse. All five of my books were written right on this right table. Right on this beautiful You're right place. here. Well, we're going to give everyone a little view, you know. Well, behind you is a bathroom, there's a shower, there's a sink, there's a toilet and behind that. Up above you is a king-size bed. You know, I have my computer in here, there's air conditioning in here, there's a view that, that we can show. It is. It, it, there's no two days that are the same up here. So when my children, my wonderful, I call my perfect children, drive me crazy, um, and my hair gets bigger than this, can I come here and just <laughs> <laughs> and simply be? Wow, oh, this yes. is amazing. It is very relaxing. And a lot, a lot of people that come through here, um, I know Oprah, some of the people that came here to interview were 2020, I think. 2020, yep. yeah. Yeah, we've got a lot of people three. in this treehouse. Yeah, yes. it's a beautiful yeah. place. And um, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to share a little something with you. And uh, we'll be right back. Back, uh, continue con conversation with Frank, uh, my amazing neighbor, wonderful heart. And uh, today, there's a little something we normally do. And um, we're going to, you know, a humble beginning of the show, we'll present this to you, where you can read. Oh, that's <laughs> me running through the streets of Haiti. <laughs> Let the people see. This is beautiful. That's me <laughs> doing a running race yeah, with a lot of the, the Haitian kids, children. I know. That I know. is, uh, where was this? This might have been Port-au-Prince or St. Mark. I can't remember exactly where that was. Yeah. Wow, thank okay. you. Can very you read much. it to us? I'm, I'm gonna have to put my glasses on. That's I okay. I, I wear my specs as well, but you know, not today. <laughs> one. Okay, so here's what it says. It says one of my labeled local celebrities in my own town, Frank McKinney, known as the White Haitian. <laughs> we jumped the gun on that one. Uh -huh. Is not Haitian-born nor by blood, although we are one people, one source, and this man is living by these words. Watch for my conversation with him on camera and you will find out why and how he earned that magnificent label as the White Haitian. In the fame world, he is a real estate rock czar and a philanthropist. Yes, the man who builds houses that are worth millions yet has his office in a treehouse, where we are at this moment. His life verse is Luke 4, 6. You think you know Frank. 
Please read about him in A Conversation of Transformation by M.J. Altidore. Wow. You uh, <laughs> I got a That's a little humble gift. For That's a wonderful you. gift. Thank you so much. And the words mean as much as the photo. Yes, yes. How's the family? How's your wife? I mean, you know, I was coming here. I saw her. I didn't get a chance to... Oh, she, yeah, she, she, was, she, she was doing laundry or something, so she wasn't all made up. She you guys are so amazing, <laughs> down to earth. I mean, oh my God. You know, it's just amazing. Well, you know, you know the, the, the place we've lived, we've lived in our house for 18 years. And like you said, my daughter was brought home here from, from the hospital. And, yep, and she'll be leaving soon. And you're right, empty nest. Yeah. I mean, I would have another oh, kid if we feeling. could. I know. <laughs> I know that feeling. Yeah. It gets better, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, you know, you get to see... You know her out there, spring her wings, all the stuff that she was still in her, her sister, yeah. spiritually. You know all those things. I can't wait. To see. Can't I'm wait. seeing it. I'm seeing, like you say wings. I'm seeing them spread before yeah. my eyes, and you just you thank God that that child came from you. We got a little talk show host in action here. Yes, she's yeah. definitely. She's very good. I've seen her in action doing. She's her very, thing. you know, she's very shy, but when it comes time to get behind it, you know, like sitting where you're sitting. I like that too. Look she's that. good. <laughs> I I really don't even know how I have conversations. Some people say, "Oh, you're not shy." Oh, yes, I am. Yeah. You're a conversationalist. Yeah, conversationalist. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Frank, I gotta give you a hug. Yes. <laughs> and I love the shirt. Oh, thank you. And thank you thank for you. my photograph. Thank you for thank being you. For, you. Yes. Thank you for being amazing. Thank you for being a servant in service because we know the secret truly is to be in service. You know, when we serve, you know, the Lord and. Right. That's how it is. You know, I tell people sometimes, you know, when I do bless you, I'm not waiting for a blessing from you because I'm already blessed. And right. my blessing comes from the Lord, so I can wait around. That's what everybody should. That's a yeah. good way to close this program. Yeah. That yeah. The blessing comes from the Lord. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank you guys for watching. And um, as always, you know, serve, believe, likewise. Um, trust your higher power. Trust yourself. And uh, create and design your life. You know, until next time. See you with Simply and Jack. Cheers. Take care.